Hello, everybody. My name is Jason Dinos. Hi, everyone. I'm Elijah Leonin. And today we're going to talk to you about polyester resin failure analysis research project that we've been working on. So to give you a bit of background, um, we're going to be discussing this uh, failure analysis investigation of a polyester uh, resin receptacle. Batch the plastic in question, which we're going to call the bad samples, was observed to crack prematurely um, when compared with the good samples. This prompted an investigative effort to determine what mechanical differences, um, if any, could be observed between the good and bad samples. Additionally, we plan to conduct analytical tests in an effort to determine any chemical, structural, or polymeric changes which might explain the premature failure. So the tests that we conducted are as follows. A thermogravimetric analysis, TGA, differential scanning calorimetry, DSC, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, or FTIR, a mechanical bend test, uh, drop ball impact test, and micro hardness test. So we'd like to give you some basic uh, background information on the material in question. Unfortunately, since the material and product are proprietary, we can't give specific numbers, but rather rough ranges for values. So as you can see in the data table, the polymer has a melting temperature of 250 to 270 degrees C, a tensile modulus between 10 and 15,000 megapascals, a stress at failure of 150 to 160 megapascals, and a max strain of 2 to 3%. So next, I'm going to hand you guys over to Elijah, who's going to go into our analytical tests. So to begin our analytical test, we're going to start off with the thermogravimetric analysis, which is a TGA. And you can see to the right there is a diagram of a TGA we similarly use for testing. And the TGA mainly measures the weight changes at a given temperature, at a given time and temperature. If we move on to our next point here, it shows that as our sample continuously heats, the weight percent is recorded, such as it's either hanging hanging on a kind of a scale or on top of a scale. So as the temperature increases, the material will degrade, causing the weight percent to change. And typically you, it's heated from 25 degrees Celsius to 875 degrees Celsius, and usually at a rate of 20 degrees Celsius per minute. And here are our TGA results. As Jason said, we can't go into too much detail but uh, the weight percent is on the y-axis there, which shows uh, the weight percent changes. And then the x-axis is our temperature in degrees Celsius. And as you can see, uh, to begin the graph, uh, well, our bad samples is the blue line there and our good sample is the red line there. There's a similar degradation temperature. As you can see, right, right when it flat lines, it has a really big dip there. And it looks like they start dipping at the, uh, relatively same temperature. And the also have a similar total weight percent loss. So from 100%, it looks like it's around a little bit above 26%. So it looks like the total weight percent loss is around 70% uh, total. And then after a certain temperature, after a certain temperature, it looks like they maintain their weight percent. So a little bit on, on the bottom, uh, bottom right half of the graph there, the weight percent remains constant. And as you can see, at different times of the graph, the bad sample degrades a lot faster, not a lot, but slightly faster than the good sample. So you can see in a little bit at the beginning, it uh, dips a little bit faster, the blue line compared to the red line. And then uh, at the other half of the test looks like the blue line also degrades a little bit faster than the red line. Um, so moving on, we have our next test, which is the differential scanning calorimetry, which is the DSC. And a, figure to the right is kind of something we used during testing. And the DSC measures the physical and chemical changes at a given temperature. And essentially this uh, test has, heats and cools the sample, which we refer to as heating cycles and cooling cycles. And the heating cycles uh, and cooling cycles provide information such as we'll see as peak temperatures, enthalpy values, uh, glass transition temperatures. So a lot of inf important information that we can acquire from these graphs. And here are our DSC results here. You can see on the y-axis, we have a heat flow of uh, milliwatts per milligram. And on the x-axis is another temperature uh, in Celsius in degrees. 
And above is the lighter, lighter gray color, which is the bad sample, and the black gray color, which is the a good sample. These two graphs are a bit superimposed, but we separated them apart so we can tell the difference. Um, one of the points we want to highlight is the glass transition temperature, which is kind of the first bump on the graph, not the peak, uh, not the first peak we see there, but a little bit before that. You can see that the uh, bad sample kind of uh, dips a lot sooner. So it looks like the bad sample actually gets a little bit softer sooner than the good sample. Um, and then you can also see that our peaks occur at different temperatures. Uh, you can see that our, our first peak there, the gray, which is the bad sample, is a little bit shifted over to the right compared to the good sample. And it looks like that uh, valley on the right looks like it's pretty similar in our, in our graph there in the peak temperatures but they do have a difference there in the, in the first peak. And then uh, the good sample shows higher enthalpies. So another, like I said previously, important value are the enthalpies. And the way to calculate that is to integrate the areas under the curve. So those, those, peak, those peaks and valleys, if you were to draw a baseline a little bit parallel to the, to the, to the lines at the bottom, you can calculate under the curve, which are the enthalpy values. And then the greater the enthalpy, it will show a greater value of crystallinity. So that means that the, the higher enthalpy value, such as the good sample, has a higher crystallinity, which is a little bit of a better, better solid structure. And then moving on to our last analytical test, which is the Fourier transform inference spectroscopy. And the diagram to the left there is what we kind of use in testing it identifies organic compounds. So essentially it's kind of like a fingerprint into our sample and identifies what our sample exactly is. Uh, and the way the FTIR works is that it absorbs infrared light causing the molecules to vibrate in the sample. And as those molecules vibrate, it measures the absorb absorbance of the sample. And then you'll see in a graph how it kind of compares the light absorbance to this certain wave number on them. And here are our FDIR results above in that green graph, there is the bad PET specimen. And then the, on the bottom is the good PET specimen in red. And if you look closely on these graphs, there's not really a distinct difference at all. They're, they're almost identical or pretty much identical. Um, so that indicates that our sample is, um, they're, they're, they came from the same material, but they are both PET polymers. So we couldn't really identify any difference. So the same sample, then we couldn't find any. So same samples and we can't find any difference that happened to them using this test. And then I'm gonna hand it now off to Jason, which will, he will begin to talk about our mechanical tests. Right, so the first mechanical test that we conducted was a three point bend test. Um, as you can see from the figure, a three point bend test is conducted by placing a flat rectangular specimen on two supporting points and then bending it with a third loading point. The load point is attached to a mechanism which increases and records um, pressure until the sample fractures. Um, the stress at break is recorded and then used to measure overall strength. Here are the results from our three-point bend tests. As you can see from the figure at right, the good samples had a significantly higher average breaking stress with a mean that exceeded the bad by 40%. The t-test conducted in the data showed that the mean good exceeded the mean bad at the 99% confidence level. Next, we have microhardness tests conducted using a Shore D durometer and stand. A microhardness test uh, is conducted by measuring the depth of indentation for a constant applied force given a standard indenter. The measurement recorded is a dimensionless value, which allows for a relative comparison between two or more samples. Here are our results for the hardness testing. As you can figure, see from the figure at right, these results are much closer with the bend, than with the bend test, um, with the good only being 3% higher than the bad. Um, a t-test we conducted on the data resulted um, in a mean good exceeding the mean bad at the 99% confidence level. So last but not least, we have the drop ball impact test. A drop ball impact test 
is conducted by dropping a ball of a fixed mass from varying heights onto a specimen below. Um, after drop, the specimen ex is examined for any evidence of visible cracking or fracture, which would denote a failure. By conducting multiple trials at varying heights, we can determine the mean failure height, which is the average height necessary to induce a failure. And now we have our results. As you can see from the figure at right, blue dots indicate drop from which no failure occurred, while the red X's indicate failure. The good samples were able to withstand much higher impact energy than the bad, with the good samples having a mean failure height that was 40% higher than that of the bad. Also note that the bad data was more widely dispersed, a trend noticeable across all three of our mechanical tests. So next I'm gonna hand you off to Elijah, who's gonna give us a conclusion. Yep, in summary on our conclusion here, we can kind of gather all our data and tests and kind of come to a conclusion. Our, the reduction in strength and hardness, we could find through the mechanical test that Jason was speaking about and how the bad samples kind of have reduced strength and hardness. And the structural changes may have caused reduced crystallinity, kind of how I talked about in the DSC or TGA, how uh, the lower enthalpy values, so a lower crystallinity for the uh, bad sample. And then there are no evidence of variation in the chemical composition, which refers to the FTIR, meaning that we knew that they are, they're they coming from the same material, that there's no difference, that they are both indeed made out of the uh, PDT sample. And then processing uh, variations may have led to these thermal mechanical results. So our hypothesis is that some moisture got into our uh, PET sample during the manufacturing process. And that's the reason that kind of led to all of these, uh, the, the mechanical strengths, hardness, and the, and the crystallinity changes. Is there any questions from anybody? 